Hello. Thank you for joining us today for the AWWA-sponsored webinar on Use Two-Step Disinfection as a Multi-Barrier Approach for Safe Water. I am Liz Ralph. I'm a standards engineer here at the American Water Works Association, and I will be your, moderate, your moderator today. Here are some tips to enhance your webinar experience. We recommend that you close out email, instant messengers, and any other programs not currently in use as they may interfere with a smooth reception of the webinar, causing slide buffering and poor sound quality. Technical assistance can be found at the GoToWebinar technical support page at the link listed in your handouts and on the slide shown. As soon as you close the GoToWebinar screen to leave the webinar, a window will open with a survey questionnaire. We ask that all of you take a few minutes to answer the survey questions. Your feedback is important to us and helps us improve webinar programming. We encourage group participants to pick one person to enter collective responses to the survey and submit them to us. I am pleased today to introduce our distinguished panel of experts for the program, John McLean and Jonathan Dick. This webinar will focus on the driving trends that call for developing the multi-barrier disinfection method According to ASCE, 80% of water used for drinking comes from surface source water. Open surface water sources are vulnerable to runoff and other forms of contamination, posing a threat to public health. The threat can be effectively deactivated using on-site hypochlorite generation systems and UV disinfection as a multi-barrier approach in two-step disinfection. The two disinfection steps used as a multi-barrier have become important in the United States and globally to ensure healthy drinking water that is free of harmful organisms. Our panel will be happy to answer your questions. Feel free to submit questions anytime throughout this broadcast by using the question point pane at the lower right of your screen. Please include your name, city where you are viewing the webinar, and the name of the panelists to whom your questions should be directed. Let's begin. John McLean is the Vice President of Research, Development, and Engineering for Evoqua. John will be covering driving factors behind multi-barrier disinfection. Take it away, John. Thank you, Liz, and welcome, everybody. Thank you for taking the time to listen to what we have to say. Uh, th this is a multi-barrier discussion. This isn't a one or two step. This is a multi-step approach. We will uh, be very happy to answer questions as they arise, if they're complex questions, then we'll answer them you know, one on one offline. So look, multi-barrier really, it's a combination of, of techniques that render the water wholesome, safe, and fit for purpose. As we go through this process, we'll see that some of the chemistry has trade off, some of the chemistry in fact it doesn't work against some of the bugs. Many of the microbes have become chlorine tolerant. So we'll see that there, there's a role for chlorine, for chlorination, for chlorine dioxide, for UV, and on-site generated chlorine also plays a critical role. So chlorine is, is the most widely used disinfecting chemical we have globally. It's served as well for over 100 years now. Um, the, the EPA in the US mandates a residual is provided to customers. It keeps them safe, it keeps their articulation systems free of pathogens. It typically comes in, in free chlorine, chloramine, or as chlorine dioxide. They're the three most uh, common options. It's very low cost, very reliable, um, and it, it's been proven to, to, to make water safe. Ozone and UV have grown dramatically in the last few years. Um, they have a number of very important advantages. They, uh, there's nothing that's tolerant to, to UV. Uh, we'll see that um, Cryptosporidium and Giardia and Listeria are now pretty well um, tolerant to chlorine. They, they have a downside, however. There's no residual. So once the UV is part, once the water is passed through the UV system, there's no residual benefit. So they are best used as one of a combination of techniques, typically chlorine dioxide, UV, and then chlorine. They can be used as a primary disinfectant to, if you like, to do the heavy lifting. They'll do the, the, the majority of the disinfecting of the water, and then you can add chlorine as a, as a 
residual for the reticulation system, and this can help mitigate the disinfection byproducts. So, in terms, in terms of, you know, in terms of, of some of the questions, what types of disinfection byproducts do you see? Are you struggling with heterocetic acids, THM families, chlorates and perchlorates, bromates, or, or what else? You know, this is an interesting question to see the kind of disinfection byproducts that uh, operators are facing. So if we start to look at how a conventional drinking water system is, is laid out, typically there'll be a water source. Um, we see a pre-chlorination phase, uh, which has often been replaced by a pre-chlorine a, a pre dioxide phase. This can be used to reduce the disinfection byproduct precursors. It can be used to settle out um, iron and manganese before filters and coagulators and flocculators. It's often a multi-stage, multi-injection point technique. So we see coag flocculation, sedimentation, the usual filtration steps. Then we start to see the UV after the filters, before a clear well. And then post-UV, we then see the chemical addition, be it chlorine or increasingly chloramine or even a, a, a third dose of chlorine dioxide. We then see the water sent forward into the distribution system, and we see the storage, and we see then the, the, the consumers. Operators battle with um, the issue of biofilm, with nitrification. Um, we'll, we'll show how chlorine dioxide can play a role with, with, with those issues. <coughs> chlorine dioxide really has, has come to the fore in the last probably decade because of the the rigor, the increased rigor we see with disinfection byproducts. The original disinfection byproduct rule allowed you to sample over the whole articulation system and take an average of the disinfection byproducts. The rule has been tightened and it's no longer a system wide average. You have to identify the locations with the highest disinfection byproducts now, and they then become the sampling sites. It's become much harder to meet the disinfection byproduct rule, and hence chlorine dioxide, the use has grown dramatically. THMs have a, an MCL maximal contaminant level of 0 0.08 milligrams per liter. Well, the five heterocytic acids is 0 0.06 milligrams per liter. The, um, the use of chlorine dioxide is far more selective than the other halogens. You pre-oxidize the chlorine dioxide the, um, the, the formation of these precursors is, is minimized or eliminated altogether. Cubic acids and the other uh, precursors are reduced to chloride. This can then be removed with co coagulation filtration. The process doesn't form disinfection byproducts like regular chlorine might. So it, it's a very important role in mitigating their formation. Chlorine dioxide is broadly microbial. It's unaffected. It has no um, effect on the heliocytic acid levels. It can be used to mitigate the formation of trihalomethanes. It can be used to drop out iron and manganese. And if you send some chloride forward, you can use it to inhibit the, um, the, the, oxidize, the ammonia oxidizing or the nitrogen oxidizing bacteria in, in the reticulation system. It lends itself well to use with with UV and or carbonation. So it can be used to reduce disinfection byproducts and to gain contact credits. At the head of the treatment train, it can be used in low demand waters to uh, remove uh, methyl isoboreal or geosmin, but some of the case may have compound problems. It can be used in high demand waters to drop out iron manganese. It can be used for taste and odor mitigation. Um, at the intake, if there's sufficient time to react, it can be um, used to control zebra mussels and quagga mussels and lindaperna. Um, it'll improve coagulation and it'll assist in the, in, in the preparation of the water for the physical and the subsequent chemical processes that will follow. Okay. So after, after sedimentation, 
it, it will um, it can reduce the demand for increased CT. Um, before ozonation, it can reduce bromate formation. Uh, it will reduce the ozone demand of the water. And in transmission lines, it will play a very effective role. It controlling biofilm, um, it will prevent nitrification, it will extend the life of chloramines, it will stop zebra and limnoperna and quagga mussel growth. So it's a very, very useful distribution system residual. This is a case that we, we piloted in, in, in Kansas. And you can see on the left-hand side of the, of, the, of the graph are the, the MCLs for um, THMs and the heterocytic acids. You can see that with no chlorine dioxide, the, the plant was in breach. As you work toward the right, you see the, the dose of chlorine dioxide go from a half ppm to 1 ppm to 1.25 ppm. So it takes some pilot to work. It's, it's not a straightforward to apply chemical. You need to understand the plant chemistry and the, and, and the water chemistry also. But it's possible to pre-oxidize and, and get what would be a non-compliant water source into compliance and the disinfection byproducts under the MCL. So as we said, we, we can oxidize the THM precursors. We can decrease the THMs by up to, up to 70%. We can reduce the uh, halocytic acid formation by 50%. We, we, we typically see doses between one and 1 1.4 ppm applied applied as a pre-oxidant, um, they are applied at the intake, pre-coagulation, um, and often we see the dose split, we'll see a multi-level injection, 1.1 1, 1 and 0.3 into the raw water and just before the filters. If the water is very high in TOC, if it's warm, then we might see a higher dose, but these are indicative of the typical doses we see. This is a, a study undertaken by by Nail Kondo in 1978. You can see that chlorine forms THMs as chloroform, whereas the chlorine dioxide doesn't. So you can see over time, over 50 hours, there was no uh, elevation in, in, in uh, THMs, whereas the chlorine readily formed. Um, you can see tailing in the graph as we go to the higher contact time. This, this slide really sets out to show why, why a multi-barrier approach is necessary. If we, as we drop down free chlorine, chlorine dioxide, ozone, and chloramines, then as we work across, you can see the, the contact time, the CT that's required. So you can see that for free chlorine is relatively effective against, um, for, against viruses. You can see that the chloramines aren't. You can see that for, gi for Giardia, chloramines ju just don't do it. You can see that um, for Cryptosporidium, chlor chlorine just doesn't do it. So, th so this slide shows well why a multi-barrier approach is useful. It shows the impact of temperature on the process, um, and it serves to show why most treatment plant operators adopt a multi-barrier approach. The chemistry is, is pretty well understood pH is above seven, we see a very fast oxidation of manganese, solid manganese. Um, iron the same, you know, we see uh, between 0.25 and 1.2 parts of chlorine dioxide able to oxidize at one ppm of iron. It's a function of pH, but the reactions occur very quickly and are a very effective oxida oxidation and therefore settlement reactions, so, so allowing it to be removed. So again, a, 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 another example of a multi-barrier approach, a, a, a lake or a river, um, safety reservoir, a receiving water reservoir. There might be a, a, a ferric dose. Chlorine dioxide might be injected um, initially. The, the filters, um, there'll, there'll be a, a flocculation stage. There'll be, uh, typically ozone might, might appear, more, more ferric added. As we go through, um, GAC is used increasingly. Then we, then we go through a UV phase, and then the chlorine goes in after the UV. It's very important to get the sequencing right. Chlorine goes in after UV, not before, because the UV will effectively remove the chlorine. 
So, so the, the, the sequence of the process is very important. <coughs> ultraviolet. Ultraviolet is a, a widely used municipal barrier. It is used really because there are uh, flora and fauna that chlorine can't kill. We call these chlorine tolerant species. Cryptosporidium and Giardia are two of the better known ones. Um, but these are the microbes where no amount of chlorine will, will, will damage them. In 1993, Milwaukee had a very large outbreak. People died. Thousands of people were, were rendered unwell. Um, and it was the first major full-scale outbreak of a chlorine-tolerant parasite. Um, Cryptosporidium is now um, ubiquitous across um, North America, and UV is fitted as a as a typical um, process barrier. It's designed to remove really the, the, the chlorine torrent species. Um, the systems are validated by third parties, and, and their use is pretty well controlled. UV doesn't create disinfection byproducts. It's a physical process. It's an elegant, simple, non-intrusive. Um, there's no chemical added. There's, a, there's no chemical change in a disinfection level dose. The systems are validated in accordance with the EPA protocol. The NSF has a standard for UV. Um, the various reuse markets have different standards that they hold, that they treat the water to. But the control of UV is validated by, by third party testing. Medium pressure systems are typically used for, for drinking water. The, the liver dose is very low. The footprint is, is very small. The systems use very few lamps. They can be monitored and wiped. Um, the contact time might be a fraction of a second, and they are suitable for gravity flows or for pressurized lines. So that the head loss is very low. There's certainly no need to repump. So if you, if you have any, any questions for either, either for, for me or for, for Jonathan Dick, please go ahead and submit the questions and we'll, we'll answer them online. Thank you, John, for that overview of the different methods of disinfection, disinfection byproducts, and the multi-barrier approaches. Um, now we will transition to um, our next speaker. Jonathan Dick is the Global Product Manager of Hypochlorite and Dosing of Evoqua. Jonathan will be covering advantages of two-step multi-barrier disinfection. Take it away, Jonathan. Thank you, and good morning, everybody. I hope this is proving a little educational for all of you. Um, thank you for taking the time to join us today. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start out with kind of the same slide that John McLean uh, went through and why, what is chlorine and why do we use it? So chlorine is a very powerful oxidizing agent. It makes it very highly efficient um, disinfectant. It has a very high ORP oxidation reduction potential. Um, and what this does is it kills disease causing pathogens, bacteria, viruses, and protozoa that commonly grow in your water and your supply reservoirs on the walls of your water mains and storage tanks. And chlorine has been around for over 100 years now in water treatment. Um, it actually started in the late 1800s, I believe, but it wasn't really fully developed until the early 1900s. And in the 1900s, it, at that time, there was one in every 1,000 people that had a case of typhoid fever or cholera or a different type of infectious disease. And today, less than one in every million people are di diagnosed with one of these infectious diseases. And because of the success that chlorinating water has seen, the CDC actually uh, named chlorination one of the 10 greatest public health achievements of the 20th century, along with vaccination and a, a couple others. So it's a very important thing uh, that we do to our water. Uh, and the EPA has a, as you all well know, it has a regulation on having a chemical residual in your water treatment. So again, it's not a, it's not a solve all problem type of chemical. There are disinfection byproducts that come with it that we're gonna discuss further here in a little bit. 
So chlorine can be transport, or transported in uh, different uh, forms. The most widely used over the past 100 years or so has been gas chlorine uh, due to its ease of <clears throat> uh, use and potency. Chlorine dioxide and calcium hypochlorite and are also other delivery methods among chlorine gas. Um, the next biggest one, uh, probably the most prominent today, is sodium hypochlorite. And sodium hypochlorite has a lot of, a lot of advantages that we will uh, discuss here in the next couple of slides, but it also has a couple of disadvantages as well. So we're going to go ahead and cover those in the next few slides. So what are the advantages of using on-site sodium hypochlorite? So the big advantage is using hypochlorite versus chlorine gas reduce the risk of handling the chemicals. So this is bulk bleach. It's 12.5%, so it's still a hazardous chemical. But if you have a have a trucker or a uh, tanker spill, it's not going to put a whole community at risk of um, toxic gas. So the transportation and the ease of um, storing it on site is a big advantage uh, for the safety of the people around it and also at the plant. Um, so it's it's a far more readily available um, way of chlorination. The next biggest advantage is the simplicity of a bulk type of chlorite system. The main components needed are only just a tank, a pump, and basically a residual analyzer, and you can have a full, full on disinfection system. So it's very popular in remote sites um, outside of the water treatment plant at wells or things of that nature because of the simplicity. And also operator comfortability is pretty high because of the limited amount of components in the system they need to maintain and upkeep. And then the, the main one we're going to talk about today that I'm going to focus on is on-site generated um, dilute 0.8% hypochlorite. So if you look at the list here compared to the last slide, you'll notice it shares a lot of the same safety advantages as bulk hypochlorite, but there is a big um, difference in the dilute portion of it. So <clears throat> I'll get into more de detailed discussions on how we can control and mitigate byproducts um, with this lower strength sodium hypochlorite. The, one of the big disadvantages of the bulk 12.5% bleach is the decomposition and the disinfection byproduct production that it actually creates. So the big thing here is the the decomposition of hypochlorite that directly relate to the formation of these unwanted products. We want to control the process as much as we can, and we have the ability to do that with this on-site generated hypo. One advantage is that uh, everything you need is basically on your on your plant, so there's um, less risk of transporting chemicals, and also the stability is the big, big factor here as far as the degradation of the hypo, because that's where all of your DPDs come from. So on this next slide, um, just basically a brief overview of the safety considerations before we get into the byproduct discussion. Um, this just demonstrates the transport transportation elements that go into getting chlorine to your plant. So as you can see, a single truckload of salt will convert to about 15 pound, 15,000 pounds of usable chlorine. And what that equates to is four truckloads of sodium hypochlorite at 12.5%, um, eight one-ton containers of chlorine gas, or 110 cylinders of chlorine gas, and also 10 full truckloads of dilute bleach if you buy it pre-diluted. So from here, you can see you don't only remove the hazardous chemical from the, uh, from the roads, but you also reduce a lot of the trucking dependence that comes with those chemicals. So if you look at it from a, a greenhouse gas um, point of view, which always isn't a, di a driving factor in a decision, but it's always in the back of people's minds. But this, is, this tends to be a, a greener alternative to bulk hypochlorite because of the reduced... Um, the reduced load that you put on the trucking industry and the less actual chemical you're transporting to and from your site. And also the, the trend on the bottom, safety goes up as concentration goes uh, down, is very <clears throat> intuitive. So again, the less you're transporting, 
hazardous chemicals, the greater degree of safety you have throughout the process. So this slide is a little bit busy, so I'll try and walk you through it as best as I can. So what this is, is it's a study done by Benjamin Staff Stanford. Uh, he did it with AWA actually in conjunction with the Water Research Foundation. And what they did was they assessed <clears throat> different factors that contributed to the formation of impurities and disinfection byproducts in hypochlorite solutions. So this ranged from, um, you know, a 12.5% to a 0.4% on-site generated uh, type of hypochlorite. So it's a very in-depth study that uh, these guys put together, and it's a very good read if any of you are more interested on the details of, you know, the formation of chlorite, perchlorate, or bromate within your hypochlorite solutions. But back to this graph, um, as you can see, degradation occurs spontaneously in solution, and it will convert hypochlorite ions, which is your free available chlorine, into chlorates, oxygen, and chloride the longer the solution sits in storage. So as that hypochlorite is sitting there, it's actually oxidizing the hypochlorite ions into unusable and unwanted byproducts. So that's the main thing we want to avoid here when using hypochlorite because <clears throat> um, chlorate is a harmful contaminant to humans and is not regulated currently by the EPA. But the World Health Organization, uh, they've established a maximum allowable limit, which isn't enforced yet, but they have it at 0.7 milligrams per liter in your finished drinking water. And this is kind of the standard that most utilities try and follow. Um, this is starting to be a very hot topic among regulatory agencies, that there may be a strict chloride regulation in the near future. So this is definitely something you need to to consider when designing your disinfection process. Again, there's not a there's not a one uh, one simple kill all solution for a full drinking water plant. That's why the multi -barrier, barrier is so important to have a full grasp on what every part does is whether it's UV or chlorine dioxide or hypochlorite for the tertiary disinfection. It's very important to realize what is going on in your plant and where you can take advantage of of certain technologies. And then we go to the next uh, slide. And this slide, again, taken from uh, Ben Stafford's hypochlorite assessment. On the left side, you'll see uh, free chlorine and the formation of perchlorate. <clears throat> so the high concentration solutions will degrade faster than the diluted solutions. And you can see this on the left graph. With the purple diamonds being at 13%, that's your typical uh, delivered bleach concentration. Uh, they usually come anywhere between 11 and 15% uh, concentration when delivered to your plant. And so if you watch that trend line go to the right over the 100 days, you can see your hypochlorite solution strength um, almost be cut in half while your chlorate strength uh, grows tremendously because you're actually converting those ions into chlorate and perchlorate. And then you can also see the trend with the green dots. Uh, that's the diluted hypochlorite, where you dilute <clears throat> it when you get it delivered. This is on a one-to-one -one basis. So you basically cut it in half with water before storing it. And as you can see by the, the yellow triangles there, you have a much uh, less significant rise in, hypo, in perchlorate and chlorate formation because of the dilute nature of the hypo. So <clears throat> the big takeaway here is don't store your hypochlorite in a very high concentration or else that'll just accelerate the formation of your disinfection byproducts. And then on the right, you have the same, um, the same trends. They're just at 10 degrees hotter, 10 degrees C hotter. So it's a more drastic effect um, up front, but not nearly as drastic as the um, as the effect that the hypochlorite solution actually plays a role in the formation of the chlorates. And so just to sum up the, 
the past two slides, uh, there's kind of three key takeaways, maybe four, um, but just to summarize, the concentration of the solution is the biggest the biggest uh, factor that plays in generating your or your disinfection byproducts from your hypochlorite. So <clears throat> the degradation occurs spontaneously, as we discussed, in the form of hypochlorite ions to disinfection byproducts. And the speed of these reactions, as you saw in the past couple slides, depend on temperature, the starting con concentration, and also the, the days of storage that you're keeping that chemical on site. So high concentration solutions will degrade faster than diluted. We covered that one. And then after 30 days, if you look at the graph here, it's simple. Um, I did uh, the, the degradation trend uh, of bulk hypochlorite, you know, at your 12%, and also at that diluted hypo, that's at the generated 0.8% uh, that the on-site generation systems produce. So you can see the effect that storage has on the lower strength is basically negligible while it's sitting there being stored. And that, that will also um, prevent the formation of disinfection byproducts while it's sitting in storage. So what is on-site hypochlorite generation? Uh, some of you may be familiar with this, some of you may not um, have come across it yet, but the basis of what it is, is water plants can make their own sodium hypochlorite and on-demand through the electrolysis of brine consuming only water, salt, and power. This process generates a low concentration, a 0.8% bleach solution for disinfection. So by producing hypochlorite on-site and on-demand, it eliminates the concerns associated with the transportation. Again, there's the safety aspect and also <clears throat> the degradation, which is the disinfection byproduct effect. So <clears throat> there's kind of two big factors here that you get is the, and they're both public health uh, related. One is the disinfection byproducts and the other is transportation of hypochlorite. And in addition to not only the safety aspects, but depending on the size of the system and where it's located, um, it can, it typically has a lower cost to the customer than actually buying hypochlorite. Uh, it does have a larger capital investment, but it usually pays itself off in a pretty attractive payback period. So the general process chemistry is pretty simple. Um, sodium hypochlorite is produced through the electrolysis of brine, consuming only salt water and electricity, as we mentioned. And you can see those three inputs on the left right there. Uh, it takes two kilowatt hours of power, 15 gallons of water, and three pounds of salt to produce one gal or one pound of chlorine equivalent. So <clears throat> you actually produce 15 gallons of 0.8% hypochlorite along with a fractional amount of hydrogen. And that hydrogen will need to be vented off safely to the atmosphere um, in order to operate the system safely. Uh, but the the big thing here is when sizing your systems or your process, basically everything stays the same. Um, you just have to dose 15 gallons of dilute hypochlorite compared to a pound of gas or a gallon of bulk hypochlorite strength. And so just to give you an idea of what all goes into having one of these systems on your uh, plant, I'll just do a quick equipment overview just to give you a grasp on the, the scope of work that's needed. Again, it's pretty it's pretty simple, but it can get a little involved um, and overwhelming compared to a sodium hypochlorite just tank and dosing pump. So the first thing we have is the brine tank. Uh, typically, you you store 10 to 30 days worth of salt. Um, we've had people store you know a year's worth of salt, and that's where the big one of the big advantages comes in is you're storing salt and you're not storing hypochlorite. This is a batch system, so you'll produce about a day's worth of hypochlorite at a time and that way you're using it fresh and not letting it not giving it time to degrade and cause and create those disinfection byproducts and then you also have a water softener uh, just to soften down the water reduce scaling and hardness uh, pretty simple and you also have a brine pump it takes the brine from the brine tank 
puts it in the electrolyzer, and then you mix it with dilute or softened water. Uh, you want to knock down the concentration of the brine from 26%, which is fully saturated, down to about 3%. So you dilute it about 10 to 1 with fresh water before putting it into the electrolyzer. And then from there, you um, <clears throat> you introduce your DC power. Um, so you'll take a transformer rectifier, hook it up to your existing AC utility, and convert that to DC power to drive that electrolysis reaction within that generator. And then after that, you have your sodium hypochlorite and your hydrogen entrained in solution, which goes to the hypochlorite tank. And then from there, you're ready to introduce fresh air and positively vent that tank in order to safely dilute the hydrogen gas down below the lower explosive limit, and then you're ready to vent that to the atmosphere. And then from there, it's basically the same um, system as a bulk hypochlorite system. You have your hypo tank filled with hypo, and you're ready to dose it. The only difference is it hasn't been sitting there for 15 to 30 days, and you know the and you know the exact concentration of that hypochlorite in that tank. So with this system, you're basically taking the dependence of a chemical manufacturer out of the equation and have a higher quality control and consistency throughout your bleach generation process. <clears throat> so what's the big advantages? Again, I'll, I'll re, uh, restate them. So if you know, if you have more control over your system overall, you'll have a better feel for what is going in there and what is not going in there. So, so you'll know the concentration of your hypochlorite. Uh, you'll control the temperature of the hypochlorite and where it's stored. You'll control the salt quality. Um, that'll reduce your chloride, your bromate, and your chlorate contribution. Um, you're not relying on a supplier to create your own uh, bleach and then go from there. And then you'll minimize the hypochlorite concentration by uh, generating on site because you can generate that stable one percent you don't have to worry about getting in a truck load and then diluting it down before storing it'll also minimize your storage footprint as well because of the the reduced capacity you need to store that um, chemical and then <clears throat> yeah again you also just limit you limit the storage time from 30 days of hypochlorite to you know a day tank so you can dose it fresh while you know the concentration you don't give it any chance to degrade and you know exactly what's in that hypochlorite that you're putting into your finished water. And <clears throat> as a disinfection company, um, as you see, we have, with Evoqua, we have, you know, we have UV, we have gas chlorination, we have on-site generation, we have bulk hypochlorite. We kind of have a full product range of disinfection products. And we'd like to extend an invitation to all of you for a complimentary audit to the facilities to review um, the specific challenges that would impact your water quality. So, and the information to do that will be given at the end of this pr presentation. Uh, you can contact myself and we will direct you to the correct people um, in order to audit your facility. And I believe this concludes my portion of the presentation and I'd like to hand it back to John McLean for a couple case studies. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, for providing an overview on the use of chlorine and more specific, specifically hypochlorite and reviewing the process and advantages of hypochlorite use. Um, just as a reminder, don't forget to submit your questions using the questions pane at any time during this broadcast for John and Jonathan. Uh, and now we will trans transition back to John McLean. Uh, John will be going over some case studies. Take it away, John. Thank you, appreciate that. The, the first case is from uh, from the city of San Diego. Ote is the smallest of three um, drinking water plants. The, the, the two larger ones use um, ozone. Ozone wasn't a, a candidate for process here because the, the lake that feeds Ote, the bromide levels are too high. They're concerned about the formation of bromates. So in 2011, they upgraded the water treatment facility, um, it serves a population of around about 200,000 people, 34 MGD. Um, they use a multi-stage uh, chlorine dioxide injection. Um, they blend um, the Colorado River and, uh, and the local lake. When they can use their own source, when, when they haven't got to buy 
water from the Colorado River, they save $40,000 a day. So it's a very material saving when they can use their own source. Um, and using chlorine dioxide allows them to do that. The, the lake that feeds the OTA plant is very high in TOC. Um, so the formation of the disinfection byproducts is, 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 is very, very high. So they, they disinfect using um, on-site chlorination after pre-injection with, um, with chlorine dioxide. And they will eventually modify their chlorine dioxide systems to be fed by on-site chlorine, by hydrogenated on-site. <coughs> so you can see as we run through the schematic for Ote, Ote Lake, um, initial injection of chlorine dioxide, the, the raw water pumping station, um, you can see that there's a, uh, um, a chlorine dioxide compactor effluent basin. Chlorine's added, pre-sedimentation, into media filters, and then they chlorinate, and then they send water forward into the reticulation system. They, they manage the formation of chlorite very carefully. They do see an advantage. Um, they can inhibit the ammonia oxidizing and the nitrogen oxidizing bacteria. They can prevent nitrification. They can reduce biofilm buildup. So they, they're very sophisticated in the use of chlorine dioxide. It's, it's been a very successful installation for us. Uh, Central Kansas water. The Jack H. Wilson facility is 133 MGD. Ozark Point is 24 MGD. Um, both, both feeds are very high in the disinfection byproduct precursors, very high in THMs. So we, we have identical skids installed at both sites. Um, they pre-oxidize, they have a pre-oxidation dose of one at Ozark Point and less uh, 0.5 at the, the, Jack, the Jack H. Wilson facility. They considered ozone, they considered ion exchange, both, both processes were discounted just due to um, total life cost. Chlorine dioxide was the, the lowest total life cost process that, that, that they could safely and successfully use. Now we have, you know, we have many more cases that we'll, we would be very pleased to share with you. If you have um, an or if you have a concern with disinfection byproducts that Jonathan offered, reach out to Jonathan with the email on, on the screen. Um, we'll be very happy to come and look at your process and advise you as to how you can retard or mitigate any of the precursors that you might have in the water. So that, that, that wraps up this, this portion of the webinar. Um, thank you all very much for your time your, and your attention, um, and be, be welcome to ask any questions. Well, thank you, John, for providing those applicable case studies. Uh, now we are going to move on and have time for a couple questions. Uh, the first question is directed to John. How do you think performic acid compares with uh, chlorine and UV as a disinfectant? This comes in from Avantika. Uh, okay, just repeat the question. How do I think, was it parasitic acid or what was the, what was the chemical? It says performic acid. Oh, performic, okay. Okay, well, it's, it's not... CL and okay, UV it, as a disinfectant. Sure, sure. It, you know, it isn't a very broadly used chemical. It's, I'm sure it has a valuable niche to play. Um, it's, UV is pretty ubiquitous these days. But the mainstream halogens are more typically used. Um, I, can, I can do some research and find out what the, what the particulars are of this compound, but I'm, I'm not very familiar. Maybe Jonathan Dick is more familiar. John, are you any more familiar with this with this chemical? No, I've never I've never come across performic acid as an oxidant as an oxidant in water in water treatment. But it's definitely something we can look into. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good question. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's move on to the next question. Uh, what is the minimum size of on-site generation system that is cost-effective compared to using bulk sodium hypochlorite? And that one probably goes to Jonathan. This comes in from Chris. Okay, yeah, that's a good question. So uh, there's really no ceiling. Um, as, as I mentioned, there's a large capital cost compared to other systems that would have to go into it. But we, as you 
Boqua, um, we have we have uh, systems that are up to 18,000 pounds of chlorine generation capacity, and we have systems that go all the way down to uh, five pounds per day. So there's really no, no limit on how high you can go. It's just what what type of capital will fit into your budget and your overall plan. All right, thank you. Uh, the next question um, I think goes to maybe both of you. Are there any wastewater considerations for this process? Water softening generates a waste stream, although that may be to Jonathan as well. That comes in from Karen. Yeah, so for the on-site hypogeneration, yes, the only waste stream would be the generation or the uh, softener regeneration, um, and that will either have to go into waste or a collection basin of some sort. And then the other waste stream would be the hydrogen, which would be diluted and sent to the atmosphere. All right, thank you. Um, here's a question for John. You had spoke about medium pressure UV disinfection. What about LED lamps? Well, look, LED is very topical. Um, most of the use of LEDs these days is as, a, is as luminaires for visible light. Understand that the UV part of the spectrum is quite different from the visible part of the spectrum. The, the, the limiting factor with UV LEDs is their size. You know, they they are still very, very small. Electrically, they are very inefficient. So whilst it's a technology we are monitoring closely and carefully, it really isn't going to have municipal scale application for some time. It, it'll, be, it'll be regulated, uh, relegated to capillary size flows, very small flows. It might um, work in a lab scale flow, but I don't think it has municipal application yet it, it might come but i'm skeptical of the drivers you know i'm not sure it'll play a role in in mainstream municipal scale disinfection right uh, thank you john um and along those same lines you mentioned uv must go before hypochlorite could one put it after yes you can but it'll chew up all the chlorine you know it's it's much better to get the, the process sequencing right uv can be used to deozonate water, UV can be used to decharaminate water, and UV can be used to remove chlorine from water. So the process sequence is very important. Chlorine dioxide as a pre-oxidant, the physical processes, the, the UV, and then the residual chlorine. That's how the process works best. That's how the life cost, the life cycle costs are reduced. All right. Um, thank you, John. Um, and here is a question. I'm just going to put it out to both of you. We use a lot of calcium hypochlorite to address color issues. Is there a more effective process to address this so we can maximize on the disinfection capacity of the hypochlorite? This comes in from Alvin. Jonathan, do you want, do you want to take that one? Uh, yeah, I'll take that one. So the <clears throat> the question is they use calcium hypochlorite as far as color control. Um, <clears throat> I wouldn't necessarily uh, use or hypochlorite for color control. Um, that's, I don't know, John, do you have any other um, comments on that one? Well, well look, you know, it's, it's easy to meet. It comes in solid form. It's, it's simple. It's easy to handle. I, I can see why they do it. There, there are better ways. Liz, if you ask the questioner to reach out to Jonathan offline, it's a complex answer. You know, so we'll, we'll be happy to, to engage one-on-one -on -one after the webinar's over. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, and here is another question out to the both of you. Uh, is there any data on formation of disinfection byproducts when chlorine tablets, trisocyanuric acid, those are in parens, are used for disinfection of water? And this comes in from Jesse. Uh, there is, you know, it's a, a simple question, but a complex answer. That there is data available. Um, the disinfection byproducts are really f are formed. Um, chlorine dioxide, the way that chlorine dioxide oxidizes, 
you know, the, it oxidizes, it, it reduces to chlorite. Um, it doesn't chlorinate the resulting organics. That's the trick. We mustn't carry on chlorinating the organics. So again, if you ask the questioner to issue the question to Jonathan, but it, and then we, he'll get one of our engineering teams to answer that. Yeah, and as far as the the data, um, I haven't come across too much data on the calcium hypochlorite in the formation of disinfection byproducts because uh, it's not as widely used on the greater scale as uh, sodium hypochlorite, and that's why there's more in-depth studies and trends done for the sodium hypochlorite, and as well as the the demand for the the regulation of chlorate has kind of driven uh, those studies to be done. So. I would I would envision more data like that would be coming up for you know the calcium hypochlorite as well. All right. Well, thank you. Um, here is another question um, for John. If space is a concern, does Evoqua have compact UV systems for tight spaces? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, space is usually a concern. Drinking water plants are generally built, and the pipe galleries are packed. So. You know, we have to work with very small footprints. We have to design um, the the piping orientation is very important for a UV system. The bends and butterfly valves impact significantly on the UV system performance because of how the water passes through the chamber. So, yes, um, we do have a lot of experience with um, shoehorning a lot of UV into very small spaces and accounting for elbows. The EPA guidelines require five pipe diameters of straight pipe before the UV system. We can't have five straight pipe diameters. We have to CFD model to show that this doesn't impact on performance. Um, so it can be done. Um, it's usually uh, achievable. If it can't be done, then, you know, then we can find an alternative way to do it. But it's, again, it's a very good question. Well, thank you. Um, here is another question out to the, to the both of you. Um, a little confusing, but I believe it's saying, does it take 30 days to use the generated hypochlorite, hypochlorites on site that were generated on site? Uh, I can take that one. I think I understand what he's trying to say. Uh, basically, no and yes. So you can design the system. We generally size it based on a chlorine demand. We'll take your peak demand at your peak summer or wet season and measure how much chlorine you use and then buffer that by you know 20 to 30 percent to give you a little safety and so the system is actually a batch system so you can have as big or small of hypochlorite tank as you prefer and so you can actually make you know a day's worth and fill that up and then once the hypochlorite tank is drained and hits a low level it'll make another batch of hypochlorite so to answer your question Question: You can either store a day's worth if you want to have a high turnover, or which we recommend, uh, we recommend you store more salt and then generate the hypo as you need it. Or you can oversize your system and create, you know, four or five, even 30 days worth of hypo and let it sit there just to be on the extreme safe side. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, and here's another one for you, Jonathan. You mentioned the dilute hypochlorite solution is more stable, but does that mean that it is less effective as an oxidant disinfectant? Uh, no, not at all. So the hypochlorite has the same uh, water chemistry as uh, bulk hypochlorite. It's just diluted down. So you, in essence, you have to pump more of it, but it has the same oxidation reduction potential as a bulk hypochlorite solution. Okay, and along those same lines, um, there seems to be quite a lot of equipment that goes into the process of generating bleach on site. Is there a certain capacity range at, at which point it becomes less feasible to use this process? I'm not sure if you've already gone over that, but it's another question. Yeah, I think, I think we, uh, we covered that earlier with another question, but yeah, we can go from, you know, a five pound per day to one pound per day to up to, you know, 15 to 18,000 pounds per day, depending on how much capital room you have in your budget. Um, and if anybody needs, you know, help kind of doing that life cycle cost analysis as far as 
the capital upfront cost and what your payback period and stuff would be. Um, we do those on a weekly basis so we'd be more than happy to help you out with that if you have the need okay and there is one last question and this is for John what is the contact time of chlorine chlorine dioxide in comparison to chlorine oh that was covered in one of the one of the earlier slides it depends on the water temp uh, water temperature depends on the water chemistry um, the simplest answer is it depends. If you um, if you want to ask the, the 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 person who asked the question to email the question to Jonathan Dick, we will they ask us a specific uh, you know uh, give us some parameters. We can give them exactly what what the, the concentration and the contact time should be. Well, thank you, John. Uh, so if you do want to receive a complimentary disinfection audit, please, uh, on your screen, you can see contact Jonathan Dick. His, uh, his email and phone number are provided there. We want to thank, thank our panel again today, uh, Jonathan and John, for those very informative uh, uh, talks. Um, and this is going to conclude our webinar today on the use of two-step disinfection as a multi-barrier approach for safe water. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you.